nous allons commencer euh, cette session. Uh, We're going to start this session on harm reduction. In another life, as a president of Médecin du Monde, I was lucky enough to develop at Médecin du Monde a model that could uh, welcome drug users, inject, uh, um, persons who inject drugs, and um, to develop also a concept that could be developed at a national level. And well, everything was aligned because at that time, Bernard Kouchner was the Minister of Health, so it was exactly the right context to, to start developing things and to start talking to authorities and to talk to the police and to start changing, maybe not the law, but change practices at least. And it was thanks to Professor Pat O'Hare, who's here, that we could implement our program. But in order to do that, we had organized a great conference in Paris, which was called Préville, uh, New York, London, Paris. And we had um, lecturers from three, these three countries, but also from the Netherlands. And it was a great event. It was very positive. Sometimes, of course, there was uh, quite a lot of discussion and uh, there were ministers there. And uh, Bernard Kouchner was presiding the conference and Pat O'Hare was the specialist from Liverpool who brought the theory of that concept and he was in our side. And, and actually, well, this conference brought lots of things because this international network allowed us to, to keep discussing about all of this because working alone in France, it was very difficult. And um, even drug users didn't want to talk about this issue and police was against us. And uh, well, from Médecins du Monde, you know, we would go in the streets and we would go to, to hotspots and we would uh, tell users about all of this. So it was thanks to this event and uh, from thanks to this gathering that uh, things could uh, be developed. So that's why I'm so happy to welcome here today Pat O'Hare because uh, you know, he was the director of the conference on, on harm reduction the International Harm Reduction Association. But actually, you were obliged to change your name, maybe. Maybe it was better to call it Harm Reduction International, right? And uh, yeah, and so Pat O'Hare will help us reflect on what's been done and he will give us some impressions on what was going on here on what what he has experienced these days here and what he thinks about harm reduction so you have the floor and i would really like to ask you to stick to the 10 minutes that you have been allocated thank you very much I remember going to his conferences in Central Pay. I mean, going to the conference was great. Going to Central Pay was even better. And this was a great man. This was a great man. And I didn't know till I came here two days ago that he died. I didn't know. But he was a great man. Two fans. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I want you to keep in your mind the word disorder. Okay, that's enough of that. Um, <clears throat> I, I worked in Liverpool in the, the early 80s um, doing what we call the Mersey Harm Reduction Model, which, is, which was public health, basically, public health. Um, there was a problem, there was a, people were injecting uh, everywhere they could in their body, and the heroin was all shit. And we tried to 
make the conditions for people to use drugs better. Uh, we took a lot of stick for it, but eventually the government, on, even under the <laughs> Margaret Thatcher, realized what we were doing was right. And so we carried on. And in uh, Liverpool, the rate of HIV amongst injecting drug users was, according to the regional epidemiologists, unmeasurable or immeasurable. I don't know which is correct. Whereas over the River Mersey and another part of Merseyside, it was 38%. So we must have been doing something right. And people started to come and see what we were doing. And to such an extent, actually, that we couldn't do our jobs. <laughs> we were invaded all the time. And uh, John Ashton, who was the regional medical officer, came to me and said, look, I realize you're getting all these visitors and you can't do your jobs. Why don't you do a conference? So that was the harm reduction conference. I said, OK. I actually didn't even know what an abstract was. I really didn't know what an abstract was. And I organized the conference. And we got over 400 people, and the rest is history. So the, the difference between France, uh, let me get on to France. I love France. Je parle français. I just love France. But, oh, France took a long time to get going with this stuff. It really did. Thanks to people like Patrick, Bernard, it got going, and with the great assistance of people from Asud and those organizations, France is basically up to speed now. But it was it was a bit of a desert, actually. And I remember being invited. Oh, I used to go to France almost every week, to Paris or somewhere, to, to make the same speech about harm reduction, same speech all the time. And people would, yeah, OK, sure. I remember one day a guy asked me a question and he asked me, I don't know exactly what he meant because he, he wanted to know what I thought, what I thought Plato or Plato would think of harm reduction. So I, I, mean, I didn't have a clue. Luckily, there's this wonderful woman, I don't know whether any of you know or knew Annie Mino. Annie Mino was ferocious. And she said to this, she said to this man, how dare you ask this man that stupid question? <laughs> and this guy just shrunk. You know, I didn't, I don't, I knew nothing about Plato. What I knew was harm reduction, this is what you do, you've got to do it. France was even, even France tried through diplomatic channels to stop the Netherlands doing what they were doing. It, France just did not. I, I don't know who the president or the prime minister was, but France was well, not good in this. Um, what we did was based on what we call the new public health. The new public health emphasized living conditions. Didn't talk about people, sanitary conditions, all these kinds of things. And so using the model of the, of the new public health, we opened uh, the Maryland Center and offered people clean injection equipment. And next door to the Maryland Center, they could also go and get uh, methadone and heroin. But the heroin, was, the heroin wasn't doled out every day, to be perfectly honest. It, it was mainly, mainly a methadone. And what happened was that Margaret Thatcher, of all people, saw what we were doing, realized oh, our, our children can be affected by this. And she put millions and millions of pounds into the system. And so we were never short of uh, money, never short of money. It was always well-funded. Um, the, there are some myths about Liverpool. One myth is that it was all heroin given out. Well, it wasn't. Um, another myth, was that 
the people doing the job were wonderful people and I have to say <laughs> many of them weren't but they were doing the job so that's that's my that's where I come from and then around about um I don't know when Patrick uh I start I I made a conference the international conference on harm reduction and there's a guy sitting there <laughs> Joanne Colomb, who was one of the people that gave me money. I went to see him and he said, well, actually, I didn't go to see him. You called me and you said, uh, I believe you're doing a conference in Barcelona. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah. He said, well, you better come and see me. So I went to see him in great trepidation. And he said, if you're doing a conference in Barcelona, it has to be the best. I said, yeah. And then he gave me money. <laughs> and that was a great conference. That was a great conference. And as a result, what does that two mean? Oh, I thought you were telling me we've only got two minutes. <laughs> After that conference, Joan, Spain just took off, didn't it? Spain became probably the best place in Europe. Catalonia. It was Catalonia, yeah. Um, excuse me. And it was amazing, the services that you put in place, every, everything that you could ever want uh, was put in place, and, and incredibly quickly too. Uh, and when there's a will, there's a way. And there was the will, and you found the way. And I, Spain was always a place that I used to say, look at Spain, why can't you do this? Look at Spain. And that, I'd, I would go around the world talking to people. Most of the time, um, I won't name the country. Most of the time, they wanted tickets to the conference and hotel room and a flight. That's what they wanted. That's what the people I was talking to wanted. They were. That's what they were interested in. But um, okay. So I really want to get onto this word disorder. I absolutely. I hate this word when it's when it's to do with people who use drugs. Drug use disorder, that phrase drives me crazy. What about like um, Beaujolais disorder or beer disorder? It's, it's like a kind, it's a, it's a stigmatizing word. We shouldn't be dealing in stigma. I believe it's a stigmatizing word. It's why use it? What is the disorder? Stand me in front of me, someone who uses heroin every day, and tell me what his disorder is. People who use heroin every day don't have any disorder. They are the most ordered people in the world. They get up in the morning. They know exactly what they've got to do. They go and do it. There's, there's, there's not, they're not disordered. Uh, my wife uses this word, actually. <laughs> my wife works at WHO, and she uses this word, and I, we often have a discussion about it, uh, and I always lose, actually, but there you go. So I, I, can we stop using that word? Is it possible to stop using that word and find something else to say that's not stigmatizing? Because the biggest job now ahead of us is about stigma and marginalization. And it's about eradicating stigma and marginalization. It's a big job, but it's a job that can be done if we apply ourselves to it. The, the, the world, according to me, actually understands what harm reduction is now. They understand, people understand. I mean, I was in a taxi driver in uh, Liverpool a few weeks ago, and the taxi driver said, I, we always talk to taxi drivers in Liverpool. I remember when my wife came for the first time to Liverpool, we got a taxi and we got out, and she said, oh, isn't that amazing? You knew the taxi driver. I said, I didn't know the taxi driver. She said, well, you were talking to him. I said, yeah, well, that's what we do here. We talk to people. So I remember once this taxi driver asked me what it did. And I would tell him I was either a journalist or a doctor or something. I didn't want to start discussing this. And this 
taxi driver asked me, and I told him what I did. Can I swear again? Can I swear? I can swear. He said, ah, oh, they should just legalize the fucking lot of them. And that was out of the mouths of a taxi driver, you know? <laughs> and he got it right. <laughs> he got it right. Uh, but we haven't done it. We haven't done it. And um, my view is that we're a long, long way from any sensible drug policy, to be perfectly honest with you. Okay, one minute on the basis of harm reduction is human rights. It's about agency over your own body. It's about agency of your, over your own body without harming anybody else. That's the fundamental of harm reduction. It's about human rights. Please don't forget that. Please, when you think of harm reduction, the words harm reduction, think of the words human rights at the same time. Because the people who are stigmatized deserve more than they get. Because most of the people who are stigmatized are there because they live in horrendous economic situations, horrendous situations of housing. And often they turn to drugs to take themselves out of it. So, okay, will people be able to ask me questions afterwards or not? Yeah. Uh, great. Okay, that's me. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Pat. Donc, on a compris le message. Euh, des ordres, des ordres en français, je ne sais pas si c'est des ordres. Thank you, Pat. Uh, this issue of disorder, des ordres, we say trouble in French. Uh, we won't use disorder anymore. And we'll try and st stop stigmatizing and ensure that our harm reduction policies to avoid the stigmatization. And I'm now going to ask marie Geoffrey Rusty to speak and talk about access to harm reduction systems in France. She's a researcher in sociology and politics. Thank you very much. But first of all, I'd like to thank the team here who've given me this opportunity to speak today. It's always a pleasure to be here. I'm going to present a few socio-historical elements and uh, data about harm reduction and the health model in France. The first thing I'm going to do is to present some of the fundamentals and the, the reference, the frame of reference for harm reduction. Harm reduction, as it's applied in France, is too often simply reduced to a set of tools and health intervention techniques. But from a sociological point of view, I thought it was important to consider harm reduction as a social movement and to take into account also the values and beliefs that underlie it, as Pat has just mentioned. Harm reduction is part of uh, the trend of new public health, which valorizes the abilities of individuals to take responsibility for themselves and also the fact that public policies must take into account the needs of individuals and be thought and designed as a function of the needs of s substance users. In harm reduction, there is an essential player, that, or an essential factor, that's the self-support movements of substance users in France historically. It's the ASUD Association, which has been involved in setting up harm reduction. And the presence of people consuming substances as stakeholders in harm reduction in France is a way of moving away from the idea of deviance and stigmatization by having them embodied by figures who themselves uh, consume substances and are fighting against this stigmatization. It's also important, even though there are opponents to harm reduction who always tend to look at the difficulties uh, that that can cause for public uh, order. But in the 1980s, drug users uh, took, uh, took control of these harm reduction methods and reduced their risks and showed that they were able, when they were given the means to do that, to change their practices. Harm 
reduction has been able to put an end to moral judgments with regard to drug use, uh, as a principle at least, with regard to what was uh, so often the case in France, a demand for abstinence. But stigmatization does persist in various spheres, in society, in the media, in the way in which substance users are described. But also, uh, as, as was presented uh, at ATHS in a session on the first day, also in terms of uh, therapy and management, and particularly because of the, prohibit, prohibit, the prohibition mode that uh, France seems to have given a priority. Historically, in France, we've had some very violent discussions and conflicts of val values, different positions between professionals who want psychotherapy uh, and uh, withdraw uh, to be the reference, and those who want to reduce harm in the 1980s and 90s. There's always been a kind of moral uh, connection to prohibition, and it's been difficult to try and implement a vision of public health, which involves the people who consume substances in defining these policies of harm reduction. In France, the violence of these discussions has meant and uh, the importance of prohibition has met, there's been certain reluctance with regard to innovations in harm reduction, which have always been considered as forms of proselytism. That's the case today with uh, health and addiction stopover points. Harm reduction could be considered as neutral. It's dominated by a biomedical register, which takes insufficient account of the social environment of harm. And again, as Pat said, we were very much behind in implementing harm reduction policies. It's still true in France, which we it took us 30 years after the Swiss uh, began introducing uh, these systems. We have a, a, a weak, neutral uh, and very health driven model, but it's not immutable and it could change. We need to bear in mind that harm reduction was built at a time of a health crisis and an emotional crisis that was caused by deaths called by HIV. And that uh, was able to change the mindsets of certain associations, politicians, and so on. But fortunately, we're not confronted with a crisis for the crisis of opioids in France, as you have in the United States. And we'll hear about that in a moment. The fact that there's no longer a health and emotional crisis, it means that the politicians feel that they're less sensitive to the need today to continue the policy of harm reduction. The origin of harm reduction is the strength of the alliances within the communities between activists, substance users, health professionals, and harm reduction professionals. And it's an association which today plays a very important role in implementing harm reduction. Uh, some some politicians at the time, they're perhaps braver than they are today, and uh, a policy that needs to be long-lasting, sustainable, which is supported by public funds. And of course, there are inequalities depending on the territories within the country. And harm reduction was constructed to as a response to infectious risk, and it's difficult to take it further. There have been some successes, and I'll come back to those on some slides. There's the agonist treatments to opiates in France. But as I said a moment ago, the problem is that our politicians, our policies remain focused on the fact that we've been successful with substitution therapy. So it's very much focused on the success of this set of instruments, but they're completely disconnected from a political vision of harm reduction, which involve, would involve some strong values, that is recognition of the right to use, the struggle against stigmatization, and the struggle for social inclusion. Just some data to show the successes and the weaknesses of the harm reduction model at, in the French style. Look at overdoses. France has so far been quite successful, less than 520 overdoses a year. And so one of the lowest levels, it's one of the lightest blue areas with the lowest levels of overdose deaths. We have also assessed with colleagues uh, who are in the, in the room and also with Laurence Lalanne and Benjamin Roland, who's also in the room today, trying to assess 
SCMRs. We've looked at a, a cohort, a cosinus cohort, and to say that there's an effect of these SCMRs. These are consumption rooms with lower risks to reduce the risk of abs abscess, overdose, uh, move, going into A and E, an, an emergency, and other crime, and so on. We can see on this slide, this graph, the situation of France with compared to other countries, uh, the size of the circle represents the size of the population involved. This is European uh, data. We have 110,000 people in France are considered as opiate consumers who are at risk, 78% TAO. So, we are one of the, we have one of the best levels in France of treatment substitution treatment but for syringes we're much lower than other countries because we have a deficit with regard to this question we're not good on the question of syringes we have half as many syringes distributed to users in France compared to the recommendations of the WHO 118 syringes syringes per person per year now, in other qualitative research that's been carried out, we showed the paradoxes of harm reduction and health in the context of prohibition. We've just finished research with Médecins du Monde. It's qualitative research. It's particip participative research with photographs, which make it possible to embody the lived experience of the people through photos of their day-to-day -day lives. Here's somebody who's photographed the places in the public spaces where they had no other choice to go to to inject. And the town that she lives in, Lille, doesn't have a, a, a health and addiction stopover point. We've given cameras to people and we then have focus groups so that people can discuss together and say what these photos symbolize, what they represented. And we worked with uh, co colleagues from Quebec, Karin Bertrand's team, which is specialized in this methodology. So as we look at these photos, we have one of the participants in the focus group who shared their, their fear of being arrested by the police or exposed to HIV or hepatitis C because of the syringes that have been abandoned in the public space. Some said it's not always pleasant to have to shoot with so many people around there with the fear of being arrested by the police. Very often they went to this space because there was no toilets that were open and I very often wasn't alone, but it was dangerous. Once I pricked myself with somebody else's syringe, and fortunately, I didn't get any disease. Another participant in this photo opportunity, this photo uh, program, said that they were uh, felt that it was difficult to inject in a way that was safe. And you can see that embodied in the second photograph. When you're injecting in the public space, it's always a bit stressful. People are on the lookout sometimes they have to go quickly and when you want to inject a drug it's a technique which is pretty difficult to uh, operate this was morphine sulfate injection it needs a particular protocol if you're doing it in the street the protocol is not always applied to go quickly and that inevitably creates problems within this research the paradoxes of harm reduction were also highlighted by interviews that we had with harm reduction and health professionals and we ch have chosen here an extract from an interview with a harm reduction professional, which I think is very symbolical of the paradox of harm reduction. The professional says criminalization creates a distance between people and the health system, so it aggravates risks, it makes it worse. Today, we have an argument, we have to argue to show that it's good to give syringes to people who inject and to build shoot rooms and to explain how you can you can take cocaine safely. But to be honest, I say this a bit prov provocatively, we're going to end up having the cleanest drug users in the world, but they will remain delinquents according to the law. They will have shown that they can take their own responsibilities of their, 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 their the way they carefully bring back their syringes and so on. We ask them to do things like that, to do, do things that citizens should do not to be too noisy, not leave the equipment lying around, but at the same time, they remain delinquents. And that this criminalization has effects on everything. It has obviously effects on their, their health, on their status as citizens. It has effects on the fact that they find that it, 
they require sums of money which are disproportionate with what they earn to buy drugs. So they are condemned to, to commit illegal acts so that they could buy uh, their, their substances, even if they're not all criminals. When you're out, an outlaw for something, you end up being a bit outlaw of an outlaw for everything. So we can say that in France, our model of harm reduction has a rather nuanced impact. We've seen that it's had a major impact on harm reduction on the transmission of HIV. Uh, this has been shown in various uh, surveys. It was more limited uh, uh, an effect on hepatitis C. There's a persistence with RIC practices and the person, people become increasingly precarious and the maintenance of a level of a high level of hepatitis C in injectors. One third declare that they have difficulty getting syringes uh, over the last uh, six months. And one third said that they'd had to inject in a public space. And that was their last injection. So what we could say today is that we have evidence-based data based on various designs and methods. They can be epidemiological, sociological with mixed methods or participative research, which mean that we can go further in harm reduction policies and propose more inclusive care. And yet it's complicated. There are still some barriers and hindrances to implementing harm reduction policies in France, mainly linked to tensions between public safety and public health logics. There are some historical moments where public health issues became predominant. This was the truth of the 80s and 90s with the HIV crisis. Today, unfortunately, the logic is more uh, public safety, uh, public security, and that's predominant. And today there's fear on the part of politicians to commit with regard to the social acceptability of harm reduction. The policies are national, but th there are a lot of uh, hindrances locally with politicians who, uh, uh, who you need to have politicians locally who can support these programs. Some blocking points, these uh, health and addiction stopovers, and, and 30 years later, only two of them have been set up in France. We have a problem with the diversification of uh, opiate agonist treatments, the program of morphine sulfate, even though there's a work group which has been set up to think about these issues. But there's also some positive aspects. We have cooperation projects between professionals and people with experience, which is being developed increasingly. For example, there's a pro project called Cooperate, which is supported by Asud and Opelia and my laboratory, or a, another project called Persiad, which is supported by France patients and addiction experts and the University of Lyon. And we also have some alternatives to prohibition, which are, are becoming increasingly relevant internationally, as we saw a moment ago. Everything should be present in place to set up health policies and risk harm reduction policies which are focused on human rights, social inclusion, public health, and the citizenship of users and consumers. Unfortunately, there are still some hindrances and blockages which need to be overcome. But just to finish, I'd like to thank all of my colleagues with whom we have published evidence-based data over the last few years on the question of harm reduction, at colleagues, scientific colleagues, but also colleagues in the field of uh, implementing harm reduction programs and also the struggle against prohibition, particularly people in associations like uh, Asud and so on, who've co-published with us. And to take this further, we've also developed in the team some participative research programs with Asud and Médecins du Monde with flyers on the question of fighting against stigmatization which were drafted with Médecins du Monde after the report. There's a webinar for which I will give you the link on the question of the war against drugs and the effects of the war against drugs. And so to take this further, please don't hesitate. If you want to discuss this further, please get in contact with us. We also have a prog program which is supported by the so so Social Science uh, school in Paris, and there's a link that you can see, and you can also register to receive newsletters from on the program. 
Uh, it's also supported by the Public Health Research Institute. And on the 31st of October at six o'clock, we will have the fifth webinar of our mo monthly program, which is called Confronting the Drug War, which was organized with a group of self-support called Na National Urban Survivors, the D3S program, Yale University, UCLA, and the Drug Policy Alliance. So if you want to take part in this webinar, please don't hesitate to make yourself known. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marie, for this excellent presentation. I'm now going to call Professor Honora Englander, who comes from Portland, is a professor in medicine, and it's true that we have uh, uh, an idea about the uh, opioid crisis, which is frightening us. We're always afraid that it's going to come to Europe, but for the moment it hasn't. Is it because of the harm reduction policy? Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Merci beaucoup uh, de me donner l'occasion de... Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I'm going to change to English. I'll be speaking about harm reduction access and care models in the USA. I have no disclosures and want to acknowledge my funding for my time here in France. So I'm going to begin by talking about the pressing need for harm reduction in the United States and um, uh, framing this in the, in the historical contents, uh, con excuse me, context for harm reduction interventions in the US. And I really think that in the United States, you can't really talk about harm reduction without talking about our history. <clears throat> I then really wanna focus on what, we, what I mean by harm reduction, which is not only reducing the harms of drug use, but also reducing the harms of drug policies. And then finally, I'll provide just a rapid fire overview of a few examples of harm reduction clinical interventions in the US. So to begin, uh, as we've acknowledged, th there's an enormous crisis in the United States with over 100,000 Americans dying each year from overdose. The drug supply in North America is ultra potent, it's unpredictable and it's toxic, often adulterated with substances such as xylazine and synthetic benzodiazepines. And of course we know that fentanyl is really the predominant opioid as well as widespread stimulant use. And treatment access is limited. So fewer than 15% of people with opioid use disorder, uh, excuse me for the use of that word, but it is a clinical diagnosis in the US uh, receiving methadone or buprenorphine. So as I've said, to talk about harm reduction in the US, we really have to talk about history. And there are certain pieces of history that really date back to the 1800s that echo throughout modern time. And this includes prohibition and harms of an unregulated drug supply, the war on drugs, particularly as it relates to race and marginalized communities, the moralization of drug use and punishment as a central strategy. So, Folks may not know, but from 1920 to 1933 in the United States, alcohol was prohibited by U in the US Constitution, which still stuns me when I say that. And this is a photograph from New York City where you can see the deputy police commissioner watching agents pour liquor into the sewer after a raid. Um, and this was sort of declared as a noble experiment that was undertaken to reduce crime and to heal social ills. But instead what happened, and again, this is echoed throughout modern times as we've seen our drug supply change, is that there's, there was increased alcohol potency, there was increased crime and violence, and there was increased corruption. So as I've said, these errors really are repeating. The war on drugs um, will fast forward, but uh, President Nixon in 1971 declared that drugs were the US public enemy number one. And what's what's true over time is that this really was a, a political and not a public health strategy. And I really, really like this quote from former White House special counsel, John Ehrlichman. Um, this was from a, an article in Harper's um, where he said the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. So again, the use of 
demonizing drugs and making drugs the label for the problem for other intents. We see this throughout US history. This, of course, sets the stage for moralization of drug use. And this is a photograph of Nancy Reagan in the 1980s and early 1990s with the Just Say No campaign. I remember as an elementary student particip uh, participating in DARE, which was a, a nationwide campaign, which basically told children and then their families that drugs were bad. We should just say no to drugs. And essentially also giving the message that we warned you, we told you drugs are bad. And if you use them, any harms that result from that, it's on you. So this really framed drug use as a cognizant and immoral choice. This of course then sets the stage for punishment as a central strategy. And so I don't have time to get into the details here, but there was a Sentencing Reform Act and Anti-Drug Abuse Acts of, 1980, of the 1980s and the 1994 Crime Bill under President Clinton that really changed sentences to longer, uh, longer sentences, more frequent sentences. There was a racialized difference between crack cocaine and powder um, cocaine. And, and so again, really putting into writing for the first time these racial differences. And this led to mass incarceration and funding to build jails and prisons. And you can see the figure here that shows incarcerated Americans as a percentage of the US population. And again, it's, it's really stunning. Um, and this, of course, led to disproportionate harms among Black people and other people of color. So again, thinking about we have this history that dates back for hundreds of years. Um, and it has really important effects on healthcare and public health. And this history contributes to widespread stigma towards people who use drugs. And that stigma in the general community and also within the healthcare community. And this then leads to negative patient experiences in healthcare, mutual mistrust between patients and healthcare providers and really fundamental clashes between, between a harm reduction model and a medical model. So now getting to how we conceptualize or frame what is harm reduction in the United States, as I've hopefully expounded or explained, we really have to think of harm reduction, not just as reducing the harms of substance use, but also reducing the harms of drug policy. I also want to acknowledge here that Harm reduction in the United States originated as a social movement as it did worldwide, really started by brave people who were tired of seeing the people that they loved and cared about die. Also in the US context, it's really important to understand there's no universal health care and states have significant power with vast regional differences. So just one example, as of this article was published in 2022, uh, 12 of 50 states criminalize syringe distribution for illegal drug use, and these are states that include those with high rates of HIV. So now I'm going to shift gears and talk about clinical models of harm reduction. There is a wide range of clinical models. Uh, this is a photograph. Uh, the image in the background here is from my home in the, the Oregon and the Pacific Northwest. I'm not going to be able to touch on all of these, and instead I'm just going to sort of select a few for a rapid fire overview. So to start with, I want to talk about overdose education and naloxone distribution, or OEND. Naloxone, as many of you know, is an opioid ag antagonist, excuse me, that reverses opioid overdose. Naloxone is a key strategy in the United States in the fentanyl era, given, again, the ultra-high potency of, of the opioid drug supply, and also that, that fentanyl is now contaminating many other drug supplies, it's, uh, anywhere from it varies very much uh, geographically, but up to 20% or more of the methamphetamine supply, for example. So OEND programs include education and training in terms of uh, overdose prevention, recognition, rescue response, and naloxone. And they're implemented in diverse settings. They can be implemented in harm reduction centers with emergency medical services and first responders in healthcare settings, including in my hospital, we have a really dedicated and robust harm reduction uh, integration with our addiction care team. In primary care, it can be in addiction treatment, though in the US addiction treatment is really often uh, much more distinctly separated from harm reduction as it is as compared to France, um, in jails and prisons and in schools. 
in terms of some of the things about implementing OEND, I would say of all the interventions I'm going to talk about briefly today, uh, this is the one that I think has been the sort of wholesale, the, the biggest success. Um, and there's been widespread public health messaging with the goal of community saturation of naloxone. So for example, our US Surgeon General several years ago put out a release, be prepared, get naloxone, save a life. Uh, as one of the, my pharmacy colleagues likes to say, everyone should carry naloxone the way, the way you carry your phone or your keys. That said, naloxone prescribing and distribution laws vary by state. So some states may have a pharmacist standing order where you can go to the pharmacy and say, I want naloxone and you don't need a prescription from a physician. In other states, there can be prescribing to family or loved ones, uh, which is called third party prescribing. Some states may or may not have criminal and civil protections for bystanders and prescribers. And this is really important in terms of um, really calling for help if bystanders uh, or uh, people who are using drugs can, can be um, charged for, for a crime uh, if they're at the scene of drug use. So the laws are hugely important in terms of how naloxone and OEND is implemented. I also want to talk about over, overdose prevention lifelines. Naloxone only works if there's someone there who's present and can administer it. And many people continue to use alone. Um, and I recently had lunch with Stephen Murray, who um, runs the Massachusetts Overdose Hotline uh, and was the, the star of the show on this podcast called The Call uh, by This American Life, which I highly recommend people listen to. Um, and Stephen was telling me that in their hotline, actually, it's predominantly women that are calling in, which is really a different uh, compared to other harm reduction services. And again, I think it speaks to some of the vulnerability and some of the shame and isolation uh, of who is using alone. These lifelines, essentially what they do is they, they can be telephone lines or apps that offer anonymous and remote accompaniment. So they may help someone prepare the scene, open their door, they give their address, and then they stay on the line and while someone uses, and if they don't answer, they'll call 911 or call for help. Shifting now to a different intervention are low barrier bridge clinics. And these are clinics that generally, uh, the goal is to provide consistent, easy access for patients to start and continue buprenorphine. So in the United States, buprenorphine access is, um, there are a lot of barriers to accessing buprenorphine and is not as widespread as it is in other parts of the world, including in France. What they do is they offer same day treatment entry, flexible patient-centered uh, care with a harm reduction approach. And settings can include brick and mortar clinic, uh, brick and mortar spaces, perhaps in a clinic or syringe service program or in street outreach or in telehealth settings. And the telehealth expansion has been enormous and important. And they can offer many other services, including hepatitis C care and harm reduction supply distribution. Typically these bridge clinics hand off care once a patient is more stable on buprenorphine. And I think this bridge clinic model is something that for places that struggle with access could be expanded to methadone, for example. Uh, in the United States, our, our laws don't allow that. Peer support services are another real mainstay of harm reduction. Um, peers with lived experience are incorporated as paid, uh, as paid employees as part of a healthcare team can provide social and emotional support, navigation, and really serve as liaisons between patients and healthcare professionals. This is a photograph of our first peer as part of my hospital addiction team. Uh, and Onisha was our first peer and really transformed care in the hospital where I work uh, along with the rest of our team. Settings include hospitals and emergency departments, outreach teams, syringe service programs, emergency first responders, uh, and other services. I think it's really important to recognize some of the challenges implementing peer programs. And this is actually a quote from one of our papers, but, but I uh, humbly will share it, which is that peers lived experience of addiction and its consequences combined with their distance from medical culture and hierarchy is at the core of their power and creates inherent challenges in integrating peers into hospital settings. And these challenges can include conflicts with the traditional medical hierarchy, that the hospital environment and healthcare settings in general can be very intense. Um, and there are limited opportunities for peer training and professional advancement. And then finally, uh, often variable and unsustainable funding. So um, again, thinking about how do these clinical interventions also re re reduce and address the harms of drug policy and the health system, the, the harms of systems, this is a quote that I wanted to share from some of our qualitative work around peers in our hospital. 
And one of the physicians uh, working on our addiction consult service described, this is an institution. And so often I feel like the peers will show us the ways in which institutions can either harm patients or not hear patients. Those are the conflicts that our patients also experience. We just don't have to see it when we're the ones with the power. And again, I, I really like this quote because I think the importance of power sharing and how that can change systems is so important. So as I wrap up, I wanna just talk about some emerging harm reduction interventions in the US. Oh, great, I've got lots of time, thanks. Um, I, uh, I wanna just briefly talk about emerging harm reduction interventions. Many of you may know uh, in New York City, uh, they opened the nation's first supervised, uh, excuse me, it's, it's actually not the nation's first supervised injection site. It's the fir first sanctioned supervised injection site. I think it's really important to acknowledge that uh, there have been supervised injection sites in the United States and many continue that, that are not sanctioned and are underground. These are facilities where people can go to consume drugs obtained elsewhere without fear of arrest. There's lots of other supports provided. And early experience from New York demonstrates feasibility and acceptability um, with, with frequent use of services, reduced um, disorder in communities uh, and other positive outcomes. However, um, overdose prevention center implementation in the US remains really challenging. Uh, OPCs remain illegal in the US by federal law and also illegal in many states. And the 1986 federal crack house statute persists. And this is a statute that states that it's a felony to open, lease, rent, use, or maintain any place for the purpose of manufacturing, distributing, or using any controlled substance. And so essentially what's happened here is that New York has decided that this is okay. And um, the Biden administration has, has been an advocate for harm reduction and is kind of turning a blind eye to some of the, the legal issues, um, but that could certainly change uh, at any point. Um, and they've yet to endorse supervised consumption sites explicitly. Even if OPCs become legal at, at the federal level, states would likely impose additional regulations. So. Um, Personally, I have a hard time imagining that this becomes an intervention that's widespread in the United States, though I've, I've been wrong before. So just to summarize, US harm reduction interventions must address both the harms of drug use and the harms of drug policy. Implementing harm reduction in the US is complicated by institutional, regional, state, and national health system and community cultures, and by politics and laws. And we have important and critical work ahead. I wanna thank a number of people. This is a photograph of my team in Oregon. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Salisbury Afshar helped me a lot and shared a number of her slides in preparing this talk. I wanna thank Professor Benjamin Rowland and, and the team at SWAL for their really wonderful support uh, here in Lyon. I wanna thank my OHSU team and our patients and then numerous uh, harm reduction leaders where I'm from and I've listed them here. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup pour cette belle présentation. Thank you very much for this presentation. This presentation that leaves us with lots of reflections and uh, open reflections about this uh, opioid crisis. Um, I was in Boston two years ago and people were injecting right in front of the hospital because they were afraid of uh, ODing and um, well, they were closer to hospital then. And I discussed about it with some colleagues in America, and it's true that there's a lot of inequalities um, depending on the states. And, and, and actually, there's a, you know this care that is provided in France. And um, the second thing that becomes a problem is the fact of accessing uh, treatment, really. You're saying that in your institution, you can get into buprenorphine system on day. Okay, well, thank you very much. Now I'm going to give the floor to Perrine Roux. And uh, she comes from Marseille and she is the director of research in the INSERM. And I would like to remind our dear friend Beatrice Cavouki, who has worked a lot with you, so thank you, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Your presentation is innovative systems. Ah, oh, the title has changed. <laughs> it's 
so I can ask you to announce your new title. It's how community-based and participatory, participatory research can contribute to harm reduction. Thank you for uh, this homage to Isabel Mabul. I couldn't start talking about harm reduction without having a special thought for her. I'm going to present today how we suggest that you could develop our participatory research and community-based research is a presentation that I proposed for a conference on HIV in Stockholm recently, because this participatory research comes from the fight against HIV to a large extent. So very rapidly, the principles of this community-based research is, of course, to work with the people who are concerned and not for them. There's this famous sentence, nothing about us without us, that was used a lot in the fight against HIV. There's a book which has uh, presented uh, what participatory collaborative research actually is, uh, based on a number of principles, of course, mobilization of the people concerned in the community, a bottom-up approach from the populations concerned to the decision makers, it's based on the experience of people who uh, know the situation uh, based on lay knowledge and living with expertise and, of course, social transformation. So harm reduction, I think, as we've seen, you know what it is. So it's more than just services and tools. It's an overall approach which can be both a holistic and pragmatic approach to respond to the challenges, not only of health, but also social and legal challenges. Uh, and so just to give you a, a reminder that the place of people is absolutely essential in setting up harm reduction policies. And that's why this collaborative research is so important in able to assess harm reduction, but also to introduce knowledge to contribute to harm reduction. I'm going to present a few elements which show how this, re this collaborative research can contribute to harm reduction. First of all, working with the people concerned means that we can reach people, these people who are very often hard to reach, they're hidden. And this means, for example, in our studies that we can reach women, for example, who are often in a minority in harm reduction departments and also the LGBTQI plus populations, racialized populations, homeless people, and a new population of drug users, which is, again, sometimes difficult to reach. They're what we call the psychonauts, drug users who connect onto forums and who are also an interesting uh, public to, to observe. So words are important. Words matter in collaborative research as they do for the communities themselves. And I wanted to share with you this report that was published by Input, which is called Words Matter. And it shows that there are certain words today which we just shouldn't be using anymore. For example, junkie or drug users. We could prefer people who use drugs. Addicts or drug abusers, we should prefer people with drug dependence. In relapse or non-abstinent, we could prefer currently using drugs. So avoiding terms in in French, like relapse, rechute in French, um, which the communities find difficult. And we talk about people who are returning to use. Clean is a term which is very stigmatizing. So all of these are important words, which in our research too, need to be used properly. The communities that we have the fortune to work with also look at a way of rephrasing our research goals. For example, the questions that we ask, instead of saying, what are interventions that could encourage abstinence amongst people who use drugs, we could change that. And they suggest that we should say, they, they put the question differently and say, what are the interventions that could be proposed to reduce harms due to drug use? That's a fairly evident question. But another point, another question, how can we improve retention in care 
you could perhaps interest how we can reduce the stigma involved in access to care and the impact that it has on management. Uh, the question, how can we encourage abstinence could be rephrased and we could perhaps say, how can we encourage empowerment of the communities? And what are the negative effects of drugs? Well, perhaps we could try and understand what the positive aspects of drugs are. So these are questions which can be discussed, but this is what working with the self-support uh, associations, these are uh, routes that they suggested to rephrase our questions and uh, they need to be addressed with scientific evidence. So we also assess the appropriate interventions which are developed by the communities. Just a few examples here of uh, scientific data that's been produced with the people concerned, particularly around education in safer injection. And this is an intervention which was validated in France and which has shown positive effects on uh, risk practices uh, in HIV and hepatitis C and a better access to uh, screening. And a paper in the United States showed how collaborative research can have a, be better at setting up personalized medicine for people using products. Uh, a, a sociological study which was carried out by uh, Magdalena Harris, which shows that training physicians with the communities could reduce stigmatization in healthcare. Another important stage in collaborative research, participatory research, is to see how this data that's produced could be used to help advocacy. And these are things which need to be thought of upstream in constructing the research program and use the right methodological, methodological tools all the way through the research program use an appropriate language so that this scientific data can then be used by associations for advocacy. And I'm thinking of a number of important moments, access to agonist treatment, substitution uh, treatment, opiate substitution treatment, annual action, which is called support, don't manage, don't punish, which also mobilizes scientific data to try and carry forward the discussion on drug policy and the context of the opioid crisis or the opiate crisis in, in the United States, we were able to show that scientific data to date shows that it's important to develop harm reduction in the United States. And I put a photo of a recent film of Nan Goldin. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a, a, a rather emotional film showing the importance of developing harm reduction in the United States. Perhaps just two examples of participatory research, collaborative research that we've carried out by uh, the team, and a, a, a survey called EPOSIM, which is looking into uh, research before you open a uh, drug consumption room. And we hope that we'll be able to open SubSum. And another project on uh, evaluation of drugs called Check Now. Very quickly, this. This EPOSIM is a preliminary survey before opening an injection room in Marseille, which was which was prepared with a Marseille organization based on a sociological study and the methodology which was mentioned in the previous presentation, a photo voice, which is a, a collaborative methodological tool, which is interesting in this collaborative research. It means that you can give users the power to take photos and to provide a narrative behind those photos and that means that you can show practices which are sometimes hidden or difficult to see. And we proposed this method so that we can document what injection in a public space is in a city which doesn't have a safe a consumption, a safe consumption room. The results, which have been published uh, some time ago by Marie Dos Santos, who's a sociologist in my team, shows pictures which are quite striking. You can see that the users have harm reduction strategies. You can see a bag on the left with sterile material. On the right, you have a bottle in which users put their used syringes. And in the middle, the places where they inject. So there's a kind of inconsistency between what harm resistance 
uh, reduction tools they are given and the scientific elements that could be used for advocacy for opening this safe consumption room in Marseille. The Check Now project is a national project designed to assess the deployment of drug analysis in France. It's again community-based participatory research with a methodology which we call implementation research and it mobilizes a quantitative and qualitative approaches with a Delphi method to see what the opinions of the experts are on drug analysis, qualitative research and a quantitative research, uh, quantitative methods assessing the effectiveness of evaluation of drugs with an e-cohort, which is going to begin soon. And I wanted to show you in this project that we uh, propose to ensure that it is collaborative research, participatory research, and that it should remain so throughout the project program and the communities and different associations should be able to follow up and co-construct this research with us. We created, alongside the steering committee and the scientific committee, we created a community-based committee, a kind of community council made up of people from the different associations and self-support organizations. So beyond this possibility for users to express themselves freely, it's also here a question of having a group of people working fully for the research program, and they've been very constructive and very useful for the research itself. And to finish, the participatory research, community-based research is increasingly mobilized. It's described in a lot of applications, but it's not always easy to, to implement. And I think we have a lot to learn about how to define this kind of research and with this goal of trying to develop this type of scientific approach, approach I, I propose that we should create a network of community-based research around harm reduction. We call it HARIN, which is funded by the, the, the social uh, the health authorities and to bring together different research laboratories with different disciplines from political science to sociology, uh, addictology, e economics, uh, epidemiology, of course, and the uh, self-support associations that we habitually work with. So it's a, a place which is very good for discussion and exchange and dialogue, and I hope that from this, uh, collaborative research projects will emerge. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I think you've understood that the discussion will come in after that. Thank you very much for this presentation on collaborative research. And I'm now uh, the, the question of giving a voice to users. I think this is a very important thing that we also included when we set up harm reduction policies. Now I'm going to hand over to an American, but an American who's become Dutch and who works in Amsterdam. It's Jason Farrell, who's going to talk to us about his project. Okay, um, to go forward, you have to push the Okay, um, good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me again, Jean-Pierre and the conference organizers. It's wonderful to be here again. Um, it's nice to see some old colleagues, friends, and make new friends. So today I'm going to talk about a project that um, I have in Amsterdam. I am the director of Choices Support Center, and I'm talking about our work in the Dutch asylum centers. Uh, <clears throat> so the organization's mission is to provide uh, support and advocacy for people who are struggling with drugs and to connect them with appropriate services and provide the advocacy needed to connect to those services. Um, we offer a range of services 
for individuals who are struggling with trauma, PSTD, anxiety, and develop better coping skills. Um, our interventions help establish positive social networks, supporting lifestyle changes. Many who come to us want to make changes, but they just need a little guidance. And um, we help them take the first steps towards establishing uh, a pragmatic plan, healthcare plan or prevention plan or care plan uh, with very realistic, actionable goals and objectives that are negotiated between them and the psychologist. Um, we help people regardless of the all genders, sexual orientations. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it's a very holistic approach. And we are designed to fill the gaps of services currently in the Netherlands. Uh, we started in 2017 and we've grown based on the needs of the people that we help. Um, we develop an online care network, we develop an app, and then we opened uh, the, when we first opened, we started working with uh, men who have difficulties with sex and drugs. Then we started providing more individual counseling. Uh, we work primarily with the LGBT community in the Netherlands and in Amsterdam. And in 2022, we started working in the asylum centers. Again, we work with the LGBT asylum seekers and gay men who are struggling with drugs and transgendered individuals. Very holistic approach because of time, I'm just gonna go through this and get to what we do, um, the online registration, we have a free helpline that people can call us. Everybody receives a thorough intake where we determine if their drug use or mental health condition is severe and they need treatment, we will refer them or we're able to work together on establishing negotiated goals based on their needs and minimizing risks. And that includes the drug use behavior. We support people ready, getting ready for treatment. For those who are waiting, there's a very long time period for treatment, for whether mental health or addiction, it could take up to two months. So we provide treatment readiness interventions where we prepare people before they enter so they know what they're walking into and connect them with a center that's really appropriate for their specific needs. Um, and today we're talking about our prevention services for migrants. So <clears throat> why choices at asylum centers? Well, uh, during COVID, as you may know, many services went online and a lot of services had to minimize their capacity because of the 1.5 meter distancing. So that created longer waiting times for all services, and we became very busy. And during this time, some uh, refugees from the nearby asylum center came to us and they said, hey, what about us? And I said, well, okay, what about you? I said, well, we would like to get some support, but we don't have laptops, we don't have iPads, the Wi-Fi in these centers is not so good, we have no privacy and our safety is very difficult. So we discussed it and we said, you know what? We're gonna go into the asylum centers. And we did. Um, when we went into the asylum centers, we were horrified. Um, the trauma, the shock, the stress, um, the very much issues that people are dealing with um, go way beyond the safety. Um, it exacerbates the trauma. Um, they imagine you leave a country because you're going to be persecuted, imprisoned, or killed because of your sexual orientation or your gender. You come to the Netherlands and you're put into an asylum center and you're living with people from the same country that you fled, housed in the same unit. 
this is not a safe or kind way to welcome people to our country, especially people that are coming here to find themselves, to be free, to love who they want to love. The asylum center actually becomes the second closet, living in constant fear. What's very difficult is to adapt to the Dutch culture, to try to communicate with people. The Dutch care landscape is very fragmented. The long waiting times could be very difficult. And even if you do get asylum, you have to go back to the center and wait for housing. So there's very little appropriate counseling and care for this group of people. And the COA, we call them COA because COA is the abbreviation for the organization that responsible for housing and care for this for asylum seekers. <clears throat> they welcome us because they know they're not capable of helping people. They're understaffed and they're not trained to provide the specific support. So <clears throat> The care and work that we do is divided into two parts. We provide support and education. And underneath that comes a psychological first aid, which is required according to the Red Cross and the UN. It's not available in the Netherlands. We provide access to information and we prevent problematic drug use and HIV. We provide support to social problems and safety concerns. We provide the stability and motivation during these long waiting periods while they're trying to access any mental health care that's available um, and connect them with the LGBT community and other relevant organizations. We provide guidance at integrating into the, into the Dutch society and queer community. We provide information on risks of drug use, prevention of drug addiction, uh, information on sexual risk behaviors and prevention of uh, STIs, HIV, and more importantly, build a social network that supports a healthy lifestyle. Many come and they think uh, connecting with the community is through dating apps. And the dating apps actually um, connect them with older Dutch guys who invite them to parties and introduce them to chemsex where things could become more problematic. So we offer two things inside the asylum centers. We actually go to four at the moment. It started as one and within six months we were invited to centers all over the country, but due to uh, the lack of funding and our limited capacity, we go to four. We provide individual counseling and weekly groups inside each center. The individual approach is we develop a pragmatic plan. We help people with their problems and stabilize them. Um, we improve the mental stability, we reduce the inner conflict, we reduce the feelings of shame and self-blame, and we increase self-confidence <clears throat> and improve the management of their health. We're currently seeing people from over 19 different countries. This is a, a chart of some of the clients because of the time. These are some of our prevention outcomes. Um, pretty successful in helping people prevent from getting uh, further problems while they're living there. Uh, during the weekly groups, we help people prepare for their immigration interview, which People never had an opportunity to talk about their selves or their sexual identity because uh, it was not possible in their country and it's not possible in the asylum center. We offer a safe space for people to talk about these things. Um, some of the outcomes of the group, but also some photos from some of the groups. And more importantly, to reach people throughout the country, we developed the free helpline and a chat service. So people in the asylum centers can reach us Monday through Friday from 10 to five. 
We have a team of psychologists and students that are from the community that speak a different language every day. And I have some materials here up front that you could take. Um, our, who are our callers? And here are some of the issues that I'd like you to take a look at. So this is what our clients are dealing with on a daily basis. And uh, this is how we try to help people as best as possible. Um, it's unsafe. They're hiding in the second closet. They have no money. Many people are feeling racism for the first time. They don't know if the staff will be discriminating or homophobic. And uh, some of our milestones, um, we've developed a transgender services specifically for the transgender community. And we collaborate with the medical facilities that are stationed on each location. Um, the helpline, we prevented two suicides and that uh, we started a chat service because some people don't feel safe talking on the phone, lack of privacy, so it's better for them to chat. And we're trying to now expand to uh, several other asylum centers and have a doctor on site so we can help the transgender community get the documents they need to continue or start hormone therapy treatment. Uh, while they're transitioning in the asylum centers. And uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to speak with you and answer your questions. There's some literature up front you can help yourself to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Now, now we'll give the floor to to Koldo Calado from the Basque Country, from Bilbao. He's going to tell us about the use of psychotropic drugs uh, and the mortality associated to methadone. Bueno, a Rachel León gusti hoy. Good afternoon to you all. I'd uh, like to thank all of you for having given me this opportunity. I'm going to talk about the influence of the use of psychotropic medications on mortality associated with methadone. Methadone is an agonist which is used for chronic pain, but also for all the substitution of opioids. And it's considered as one of the essential medicines in the WHO. One of the first treatments that was adopted in Europe for substitution therapy for opiates in 1967 was an element which began to be studied, used in Sweden, and now it's the most widely used treatment in Europe. In fact, most patients who currently are following programs of opiate opioid substitution treatment uh, have a treatment with methadone for Spain. Methadone covers about 90% of the population, whereas in France, it's approximately 40%. And uh, they use a lot of buprenorphine. It's a medication that functions, it works. All the studies have shown that patients who uh, take methadone consume less other opiates than those who are not on these treatments. But alongside this effect, which is very beneficial. There are other studies which showed that methadone can lead to some adverse effects. And this has been re related with the increase in mortality. This is a study carried out in Europe, where you can see the patients who have presented at for emergency care, and who mentioned problems connected with drugs. You can see that methadone appears at the top in these a and &E referrals. It's a study where the mortality associated with drugs was studied, and it was observed that most of the mortality, or most of the cases, were associated with consumption of opiates or opioids. As you can see, 15, which were connected with methadone. 
it's a, this is a more recent study in Spain where we have seen that more than 30% of the patients who died after a reaction to substances presented levels of methadone, methadone in their blood. So you can see that methadone was associated with the presence of adverse effects and also with mortality. But what is the role of methadone? Sometimes it's uh, death, which is accidental or suicide or accidents. Sometimes it is possible that it, it, to a certain extent, methadone has an indirect relationship with death connected with effects on the central nervous system or linked to toxic effects on certain organs, which could continue to increase the risk of sudden death. But what we're interested in is the cases where methadone is directly associated with the cause of death. So we're talking about intoxication or overdose and the effects that have been connected with this kind of death with methadone. It was the, the depressive effect on the central nervous system and the fact that it increased the QT interval associated with that. Um, in this sense, other studies have shown what are the factors that increase the risk of respiratory depression associated with methadone where you can see here advancing age pathology of the liver or pulmonary pathology sleep apnea or the use of other substances uh, other drugs and what are the risk factors which increase the possibility of uh, arrhythmia, uh, perhaps female gender, uh, cardiac pathology, liver pathology, or the use of other drugs and medication that can prolong the QT. Uh, some of them are intraviral, which are used for by the population uh, with the risk of HIV, as well as other uh, drugs which are used in the treatment of certain other diseases. In that sense, there's a whole list of drugs which can prolong the QT, increase that risk of the you know, prolongation of the Q2 uh, interval, and arrhythmia, which can be fatal. Cocaine, of course, but alongside cocaine, cocaine you can see other medication which can be used uh, as a toxicine uh, and so on as you can see in the list and you can see that there's a whole list of drugs that can reduce the metabolism of methadone and increase the plasmatic levels and increasing the risk of associated mortality and, and respiratory depression and on the QT interval. So we can see that you have citalopram, for example, and others. From a point of view uh, theory, the use of uh, uh, multiple substances, uh, uh, we use sometimes in pharmacological uh, therapies, uh, can increase the risks associated me with methadone. But we wanted to see whether what uh, was widely reported was actually a reality in patients who take methadone. So what we did was we carried out a study, we analyzed all the autopsies that had been carried out in the Biscaya over 18 years, between 2003 and 2020. In this period, there were 11,563 autopsies that have been carried out in which 8,000, more than 8,000 uh, were subjected to a toxicological analysis and in a little bit more than 300, 3.7% of the autopsies, the presence of methadone was identified. Amongst these autopsies, 80% were men, 20% were women and the average age was 42.8 years of age. When we divided the periods 
uh, this 18 year period and cut it up into a tranche of six years, we noted that the average age of patients was increasingly high. And that shows that the population is aging, the population which is taking methadone treatment. If you look at the levels of methadone in the blood, it, for 50%, it was less than 0.5 milligrams per milliliter, 35% between 0.5 and 1, and only 15% of cases had levels which were higher than 1 microgram per milliliter, which is considered as a toxic level. And when you analyze all these autopsies, look at all the reasons for death, out of the 328 people, there was methadone. We saw that out of that 28% uh, had deaths which were not connected with methadone. 44% were violent deaths or accidents, suicides. And in 49 cases, 15%, they were natural sudden deaths on the cardio cardiorespiratory system. We found blocked arteries or, or realities, uh, which call other realities causing death. The most interesting thing was the 235 deaths, which were directly linked to methadone. This was in most cases link, linked to bronchopneumonia associated with this effect of respiratory depression and 64. Uh, people, 20%, and in 171 cases, in other words, more than half of the deaths where there was presence of methadone in the blood, we were not able to identify any alteration justifying death. And this is what we call uh, bl blank autopsies. And in most cases, the death can be attributed to the effects of arrhythmia, which cannot be uh, observed during an autopsy, of course. We've identified the presence of other drugs or other substances or other elements along, uh, alongside the methadone. And what we saw that in more than 80% of cases in the patients who died with methadone in their blood, they had also taken benzodiazepines, in other words, a pharmacology, which also leads to respiratory depression. And that can have a synergic effect with methadone and increase the risk. At the same time, in more than 40% of cases, uh, as well as methadone, we found other drugs on the list, and they were able to prolong the QT interval. So there's a synergic effect by incre which increases the risk of death uh, caused by methadone. On the other illicit uh, substances, we can find traces of cocaine, 35% cannabis. We found heroin, amphetamines, and 12% of ethanol. We also noted that in certain cases, the patients died and they had levels of methadone in their blood also had not only one, but several, two, three, or four, sometimes more than that, other drugs, uh, as well as methadone in the blood. Now, once we'd observed that we understood that situation, we wanted to s carry out a regression analysis to determine what was the real risk that the consumption of drugs uh, and particularly methadone could have what was the uh, the weighting on mortality and we could determine that the presence of one or two psychotropic substances alongside the methadone could increase the death rate by more than five uh, of death linked to methadone if there were three or four the increase was 9.5 and the presence of five or more substances so an increased risk of nearly 12 times. So the risk of uh, the presence of uh, psychotropic medication increased the risk of methadone-related death by 2.42%. It's used for mental health issues, 
uh, and so that increased by 2.42 times. And the presence of two such psychotropic medications increased the risk by 3.45 times. So the recent use of any illegal drug increased the risk of toxic death by 1.53%, whereas use of two or more illegal drugs increased the risk of death, as well as the methadone, of course, by almost three times. So the conclusion of our study was that the associated mortality with the use of methadone was principally due to these uh, toxic effects of uh, respiratory depression or disorders with regard to, to cardiac rhythm and the prolongation of the QT interval and the consumption of uh, a number of different substances, again, could have this increasing effect. And I mentioned, I think, 1.53%. I mean, 1.53 times higher uh, risk. And so the mortality associated with methadone is mainly caused by its toxic effects on the central respiratory depression or cardiac arrhythmia. And the consumption of multiple psychotic substances uh, that have synergistic adverse effects with methadone seems to be the main risk associated with mortality from methadone. So thank you very much. We, there's not uh, too many people left in the room. It's the last of our sessions, but it's fortunate because we have still 20 minutes for discussion. And as this is a particularly interesting panel, I would like to listen to you and hear whatever questions you might wish to ask. Uh, nobody wants to be the first to ask the question, obviously. Yes, thank you. So I'd start out with the first question. It's a very uh, rich panel, which raises a lot of challenges and a thousand questions. But I just have two questions uh, to uh, two extremes. One for Pat. He said that didn't like if we don't use the word disorder, what, what word could we use? Yeah, my question is, is about it. So you, 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 you said you didn't like <laughs> disorder or addiction for that matter. And, um, and I understand that can be stigma associated to that for sure. But then at the same time, but how, how do we, but, but so the, the, the underlying question is that, of course we can just say it's, well, someone using whatever, but then is that actually fair in the sense that there's plenty of evidence that's, Just uh, people may be using substances, including heroin, in a very non-problematic, um, in, in a way where, where they manage and they're able to get around, mm -hmm. but others don't. And yeah. is it fair to, without stigmatizing, is it fair not to acknowledge that some people need more help than others? Mm. And, and how, how do we... You how just we... used another word I don't like, actually. <laughs> yeah, but then if you just... I don't like the word substance <laughs> in this respect. Yeah. But then how, how do we speak with each other? How do we speak and, to and, each and other? With and the, with the persons that come and ask for help? Well, I hope that people who come in for help don't get accused of having drug use disorder i don't i don't suppose that's the kind of language that's used with people i hope not anyway i mean people use drugs that's one way people who use drugs is another way there's lots of ways and i think 
in fairness to the people who use drug use disorder, they generally don't use it to the to the person. It's generally on a on a uh, uh, a graph or something like that. But it's just, um, I mean, this is a very good question, and I'm trying to think of. I'm trying to understand the question, actually, and I don't completely understand the question. Are you saying that you have to use the words drug use disorder? Is that what you're saying, that you, that's the only way you can do this? No, no, no. I'm, okay. I'm, I, I'm not saying, I, I, I don't want to take too much time. No, I, but this is interesting. Yeah. It deserves no. a bit of time. Um, I agree that many people yeah. don't have a problem. And, yeah. and just using something yeah. that is illegal is not by itself yeah. a disorder yeah. or, or a yeah. medical condition of itself. And you might have problems related yeah. to the legal status, and that's yeah. not a me that's yeah. not a mental state. Yeah. But for example, I, I see people that come to me and say, "Well, you know, I'm using this substance and that." I have many friends that also use it; they have no problems, but. I find myself um, um, in in difficulty to manage. Can you help me? Probably not. <laughs> That's, I mean, drug user, person who uses drugs, drug problem, person who has a problem with drugs. If you have a problem with something, it's completely different from saying you've got a disorder. I think it's just it's it's um it's just a word I would never use to to a human being to be honest, or, or even about a human being, because someone takes and I actually don't understand when you use the word drug user or when you use the word person with drug use disorder. It's it's a language that I've never be, I've never liked, and it's. I can't explain everything that I don't like and why I don't like. It's just, that's just the way it is. Yeah, but, but then it's, it's an individual experience you have. I have an individual experience. No one, I, no one I, I have worked with uses the word drug use disorder. I don't work with my wife, but she uses it actually. But no one I work with uses that, that phrase or did use that phrase. It's 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 a phrase for for academics and researchers, of which neither of which I am. Or, or maybe it's because you you impress us very much, so we that dare I, not use it in front of you. That that I repress it. No, that you impress us. You are very important. So we don't want to say things you would not like. Oh, I'm not that important. <laughs> and I'm no more important. I, I have another anything. question for um, Luis. Um, so that was a great study on methadone and, and casualties associated to methadone. But did you control for methadone dosing? And um, eventually, if methadone with low doses, was it associated to more casualties when associated to these other substances or, or not? Thank you. Yes, in fact, I have time only to show some of the results of the of our study. We have control for not only for dosage of methadone, because always, you know, some some part of these uh, deaths related with methadone were directly related with uh, prescribed methadone, and in other ones, it was illegal methadone. And at the moment, there's no a clear relation between the dose of methadone prescribed uh, to these people and the casualties or the risk for, for that. It's not significant. Marie Rousti. Je voulais juste rebondir sur ce que tu disais, Marc, parce que je pense que c'est... Je voulais juste dire quelque chose sur ce que tu as dit, Marc. Je pense que c'est très important. Il y a un papier qui a juste été sorti très récemment dans Addiction, proposé par les publishers du journal, et ils ont dit qu'il est important d'utiliser des termes qui ne sont pas stigmatisés, mais dans certains cas, 
there are problems that we think are not stigmatizing, but which are stigmatizing for some people. For example, not using the term trouble in French, which is a kind of disorder. There could be a stigmatization of the professionals who are going to be working with people who are using substances, but they define them as being a trouble, a disorder, without being judgmental, but it's part of their professional practice. And another very important aspect in this article is that they talked about the fact that today we don't talk about substitution treatment because we think that it's stigmatizing, so we call it agonist opioid treatment. But they explain that in the United States, people who take substances are very find it very difficult to deal with this uh, uh, this, uh, this terminology because agonist sounds like agony and they think that some terms are not stigmatizing but in fact they become stigmatizing and it's the same thing with uh, abstinence or, or relapse I was very much struck a few days ago I went to the 50, 50th anniversary of the Sharon Association and I heard from both France and the UK two exper experiences of people who are activists in harm reduction and they themselves chose abstinence and they explained that for them and i'm sure that when the term abstinence is chosen it's part of the harm reduction process and they felt excluded sometimes when they talked about the fact that they had chosen abstinence for themselves but of course they're fully in favor of harm reduction but sometimes they were given a very stigmatizing message on the fact that they were talking about abstinence, but they said it was just a personal choice. But the difference is that when abstinence is imposed, that's it when it's when it becomes problematic. Words are important. Words do matter. It's very important, but they need to be recontextualized and see what the meaning they can have for all of these stakeholders. And that's why I think that it's very interesting what you've just stressed there. And I think maybe you should uh, be good if you could consult that article. It's a phrase that pathologizes a social phenomenon. Because for me, the, this whole thing is a social phenomenon. But it, it also, um, it diagnoses everybody under one umbrella. For example, when you look at the clinical uh, terminology of drug use, right? You have drug use, misuse, abuse, and addiction, right? So not every drug user is an addict. Not everyone who uses drugs misuses drugs. Um, and we could also flip it and say, do you have sugar in your coffee? Every time you drink coffee, you put sugar in it. Would you, if I asked you, if I told you you can't have sugar in your coffee, you would not really like the idea because you would prefer sugar in your coffee. So do I say you have a substance use disorder because you absolutely have to have sugar every time you drink coffee, right? For can, example, right? Can I, can I say one thing to, excuse me to interrupt, but it's, I, I would like to just acknowledge from a medical clinician perspective, the diagnosis of opioid use disorder, I think at the core, we don't want it to be a label in a medical context, it needs to be a diagnosis. But not everybody who, as we've all acknowledged, uses opioids has a use disorder. But there are medical criteria. And we can say someone has a mild, a moderate, or a severe opioid use disorder, depending on a number of factors. So I just, I, I don't think it's accurate to say that it's not, it shouldn't be a label. It should be a diagnosis. And I think that it gets conflated and misused and it can be stigmatizing. It can also, at the bedside, I in the hospital, when I work with people, I'm very explicit about the term. And I say, you know, I may use the term alcohol use disorder, which can feel very technical, but I wanna to talk to you about it the way I talk to you about your diabetes. And, you know, we sort of have a conversation about does somebody, how do they relate to that term? What does that mean for them? So it then becomes a personal conversation, but I do think we need clear criteria to make an accurate diagnosis. And that's the whole thing about words matter. It shouldn't be this PC conversation, not that this is a PC conversation, but it shouldn't be a PC or sort of politically correct conversation. It needs to be about using clear and accurate language. Yeah. And, it, and the term should be used in the right context under the right conditions. If I'm, if I'm in, a, in a hospital or treatment facility and I'm seeing patients, yes, they're admitted and they're dealing, getting treatment. So then I can understand they're diagnosed and they have certain issues related to substance use. But if we're just talking about drug users, 
That's it. There are people who use drugs. And, and they might have risk associated with drug use, which could be a number of risks associated with drug use. Uh, but there's also another word, chaotic drug user. Also got to be chaotic, you know? Okay, so, but I, we're not gonna get into that. But yeah, I think it's, it's under the, the right context, like the setting and the context, the word, certain terminology should be used appropriately. And that's probably about the best thing. Bonjour. Uh, merci pour la qualité des débats uh, en fin de journée. Uh, moi, je suis un Thank you for the quality of the discussion at the end of the day. I work in a day hospital close to here, which was set up with, by the health agency, and we work with um, Marc Encombre and so on. And I can see uh, harm reduction as a clinical tool for the psychiatrist and the addictologist in their day-to-day -day work or the short uh, consultations with graduation as a function of the patient's goals in terms of health care. And the question today as a psychiatrist for young people is the, the challenge for harm reduction is the question of knowledge. With Wikipedia, TikTok, and all of that, Telegram and so on, that you can order anything, whatever you like, in any city in France, and we don't even know what it is, because it's difficult to tell exactly what you're ordering. But this question of knowledge for young people and less young people, saying that there are products, what the properties are, what are the risks, whether they're easy, it should be easy to have access to it, the academic discourse that we're talking about. When a patient comes to see me and saying, I'm an alcoholic, I say, no, you're not an alcoholic. You have an alcohol use disorder. It's a chronic disease like diabetes. Is Diabetes is a, um, um, a disease connected with deregulation of your glycemia. And people can do self-measurement and use techniques that they can use to improve. But once, until the patients are convinced, uh, including young people today with uh, everything they order, if this, I wonder if there's not this challenge of multimodal knowledge uh, of neuroscience. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, sources. And I can see that working uh, in, in my day-to-day -day practice that this is really an issue. Thank you. Perhaps just one question for Mr. Lebeau. It's not a question, but more a remark on the fact that you should be careful about being too angelical. I know we're talking about semiology to a certain extent, but yes, it has happened to me to be to seeing chaotic, violent, violent users. Sometimes I've been afraid with some people who are threatening me, sometimes threatening me with death. I can remember somebody who said, I know your address and I'm going to go and kill your wife and your children. And at the time, I wasn't prepared for that kind of remark. And I said, fortunately, I didn't have a weapon on me because perhaps I might have been unable to not use it because what he said about my wife and children had really disturbed me very profoundly. I'm going to stop talking about uh, as a reactionary, but I think I need to be, you need to be, remain reasonable. But crack users uh, and the, the environment can sometimes be violent. It does raise problems. And I don't think it's just words which can help us go beyond something which is, for example, of the order of the conflict of interest. And just one remark. I was very much impressed by the fact that in the Philippines, there was a good part of the population in the Philippines, they, they followed Duete, who was absolutely criminal. And they can, they can they, he could, they, they were killing people uh, extra, in an extra judiciary way killing people who were users or supposed to be users of drugs. I found that extremely surprising that the population was supporting this criminal policy. And one part of the explanation, perhaps not the entire explanation, but one part of that explanation was that the scene, I would say, of for metham methamphetamine is a fairly violent scene. So that's just what I wanted to say. And just to add a little bit of non angelic discourse to this tu dis est important bertrand je pense que ce qui what you say bertrand is important 
it's important um, because it's about the violence of uh, drug use and uh, it's about the fact that people who use, well, they're the first victims of this kind of violence, but it's very complicated for certain professionals as well. It's complicated, but what matters, and this is a great difference when we are sensitive to risk to harm reduction is what we're going to bring in order to, to manage this violence and uh, harm reduction is about trying to improve life conditions of these people and giving them access to care so that they can limit this violence and uh, the responses that are proposed by certain actors and different conservative movements they say we need to stop harm reduction and we need to put everybody in jail and uh, put everybody into detox centers. So I think the difference is there in the response that we want to bring. But we have to be aware that, uh, yeah, we need to tackle this issue because if we don't talk about this violence, people who suffer from this violence will not take into account our discourses. Um, explain my view. And it's by a guy called John Booth Davis, and it's called The Myth of Addiction. And I, I recommend you to read that book. I think it was the last question, but maybe if there's one other question. I think Bernard Kuchner was, would like to take the floor. Well, I think, well, your answer somehow disturbed me because we're talking about this violence and these threats um, upon practitioners and uh, the reflections are not the same whether we're talking about doctors or scientists and it's not the same. There's always the relationship between the doctor and the patient which which forbids this kind of angelism and uh, of course there should be this kind of uh, attitude and when the response is not always economic not completely economic not completely repressive but then yes but it's never the case it's this response is because there is not suf no sufficiency in these responses. There is no efficacy in these responses. So this is a very difficult issue. And well, it's complicated. I'm sorry, it's the last answer. And it's not even an answer because there was not such, no such thing. Jean-Pierre, can we close the session? Would you like to say anything? Well then, thank you. Thank you for your presence, for those who stayed here, and thank you to the members of the panel, which was remarkable.